Hello, and welcome to the monthly New Edge Sword and Sorcery, Contemporary Sword and Sorcery Story Chat. The name is too long. We're still working on it, but you get the idea. We're going to discuss a short story. Myself, Jay Wolf, Graham, and Matt John. Graham, I don't know your last name. This was poor preparation on my part. What is your full name? My full name is Graham Thomas Wilcox. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Right, of course, I've read it, for heaven's but uh, here we are. Um, okay, so uh, off we go. Uh, the story we're discussing this month in honor of the Old Moon Quarterly Kickstarter, which if you are hearing this before December 2023, it is still running, and you should be running yourself over to that Kickstarter to back it. It will support uh, multiple issues of the magazine, including upgrading its general appearance, paying for things like art, and of course, paying a prorate to its authors uh, with an increased word count, if I remember correctly. But yeah, so it's a good thing to go and check out. But maybe you're thinking, I don't know, man, I'm your Old Moon. How would I do that? Well, we're going to give you a good example for why you should uh, by discussing a story from issue three of Old Moon Quarterly, currently available on Amazon in softcover and digital formats. The story is called Evil Honey. It's written by James Engi, and if you're familiar with him, uh, then you will not be surprised to know this is a story of his long-running serialized character, Morlock Ambrosius. But you don't have to have read anything of that character or that author before to enjoy the story. I really enjoyed the story, and one of the reasons I chose it for this month's uh, discussion, aside from wanting to boost the Kickstarter for Old Moon Quarterly, run, don't walk, to the back it, uh, is because, well, there's a bunch of reasons I'll get into, but in a nutshell, it's fun and it's funny. It has, a, I think, a great sense of humor, and that's not something we really uh, covered in any detail with uh, our previous stories, although there were some elements of humor in them. So I thought it'd be fun to discuss Evil Honey by James Engie. So uh, yeah, before I've been talking for a minute, why don't we go around the panel here a bit. Uh, Jay, why don't you give a, gr a brief introduction of yourself? Hi, I'm Jay Wolf, uh, author, editor, Bon Vivant. Um, uh, I publish books under the name M. Daniel McDowell, the first of which uh, just came out this past autumn, Bringer of the Scourge. And uh, I think that's a good one for me. All right. And uh, Matt, who are you? Oh, man, who am I? <laughs> the hats that I wear every day. It's insane. So you're asking me, actually, Oliver, a fairly philosophical question at this moment. But to cut to some real shit, I would say that I am one of the hosts of the Rogues in the House podcast. I am a uh, lifelong gamer. Uh, I, I currently work for Monolith Games. I have for probably five years now working on uh, the Conan board game and currently developing the Conan role-playing game. Uh, I write sword and sorcery and have had, had it published in all the cool places that I've wanted to. And I have recently read uh, the first Morlock tale that I've ever read. So I, I might be in a unique position that I'd have only read one and then the first page of another one. I'll explain why that is later. But needless to say, uh, I was really blown away by this character. Are we segueing oh. now? No, because we have to go to... Cro uh, we have to go to... Um, Graham Thomas Wilcox. He said his full name. Yeah, first. Thomas. <laughs> guys, do you guys think Thomas has the same sort of uh, bicep energy as the name John? <laughs> well, I hope so. It's one of my two middle names, so I also it's can make names It's to just, Thomas. it's got the whole. Yeah, it's like Arnold walking, like a tank it. engine. Yeah. It would yeah, have been my middle yeah. name if I had turned out differently. So, <laughs> well, listen, well. I, it's it's such. I don't know. Every time I hear something like that, it's like yeah. So congratulations, Mr. Wilcox. <laughs> Not a direction I thought this would go, but yes, uh, shout out to all the Thomases for first, middle, and last. Anyway, I'm going to bring a, I will Graham, bring a little so kindness to uh, introduce <laughs> yourself. Uh, certainly. I'm Graham Thomas Wilcox. I'm one of the assistant editors for Old Moon Quarterly. And I, that was my dog. You heard him. And I'm also a writer of sword and sorcery and dark fantasy myself i've been published in a few places and uh when i'm not writing or editing i am a okay fair enough uh when i'm not writing or editing i am a uh english instructor in a local university and community college all right uh, so why don't we go around the table and give first impressions? I've already said a little bit about why I like this story. Jay, uh, what was your take on Evil Honey overall? Oh gosh. Um, so I actually am in the, I'm actually also in the one Morlock club. Um, 
the chat is revealing that there are a few of us. Um, this is this was my first go with this character, um, and um, uh, I actually really didn't mind that I didn't like I I felt the the presence of of a world outside of the rest of the story, which I always really like personally. Like that's one of the reasons why I like serialized stories and why I like um, repeating characters is that feeling of a uh, a greater world around the story that I'm reading. It adds a lot of verisimilitude. And um, as you've already pointed out, it's a, such a funny story. Like there's a lot of really good um, incidental humor that kind of fills out the whole of this character, Morlock. All right. And John. Uh, by, God damn it. <laughs> your, your name is listed as M. John. Matt, who I speak to like every day. Uh, Matt, what was your first sort of impression upon reading this story? Man, I wish I meant to grab the book on my way downstairs, but it's something to do with uh, him drinking. <laughs> it might this so I guess I have to say that there is the one story where I read the first page, and then there's this story, which I read in its entirety about a month ago. And I can't remember which one it is uh, that... Starts with him talking about uh, drinking, and then he uh, gets sick and then drinks again, or whatever. Is that this story? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a rocky road, my friends. Um, it's okay, and honestly, it, it, you know, his drinking does come up in other stories. Yeah, I mean, it's a character trait. Like it's a, uh, it's a big, it's a part of what he does. And honestly, I mean. The, the first thing that struck me when I read this was like, oh, I wish I'd written that. I guess <laughs> it's, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of the sort of thing that I like to do, but, um, you know, the difference is that his voice is so, you know, him. And, uh, I just, I appreciate exploring those themes and then going full bore, just crazy with, all right, be people, sword and sorcery. Let's go. And so for, for yeah. me, like, that's, that's the kind of, like, uh, not, like, risk. It's not a big risk to do that. It's just, like, it's a cool direction and a novel direction for these kind of stories. And, uh, yeah, man, I appreciate it. It's cool. Well, yeah, it's very fun. It feels a little more out there, you know? I mean, if I was going to compare it to anything else, I would, um, in the general vein of Sword and Sorcery, I would think more along the lines of Jack Vance, you know, who's not afraid to mm -hmm. do something pretty wacky with his characters. Oh, and, yeah, that's yeah. definitely a vibe here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, th I think that shows a real security uh, with the author, you know, not being worried about, like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just try something wild and see where it goes, as opposed to, oh, I better, you know, do more conservatively kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, uh, also, it also has that vibe of, like, a Saturday morning cartoon or feature where, like, oh, it's the They Get Shrunk episode. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah like, it's, that it's is, kind of a classic that move. Is, yes, I love it, man. I was like, I don't know, I always use the term balls <laughs> when I'm talking about, like, <laughs> Just a, a weird, you know, the kind of person who's just like, I don't know. You just wear it out front is what I'm saying. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's wicked. Oh man, I dig it. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And like, it makes it stand out. You know, there's no story quite like this, I think, in any of the issues of Woman Quarterly I've read so far. And it makes it even stand out from the other Morlock stories that I've enjoyed in other venues like Tales of Magician Skull. Um yeah, no, it's a really singular story, even though the idea of shrinking your character is not necessarily in itself novel. It's a novel thing to do in a short, uh, sword and sorcery short story. I mean, other than um, uh, a couple of classic Fritz Liber tales, I can't think of any other ones where that's been done. I mean, and I certainly can't think of any other ones. Sword and sorcery story, like, just think about this for a second. Sword and sorcery stories are already kind of about shrinking people. The difference is they make the animals bigger. So, like, in Conan, giant spiders and giant snakes. <laughs> so you're not shrinking down to face them. It's just <laughs> they made the animals bigger. Yeah, Good point. And actually, uh, Kevin's time. saying in the chat here, which I appreciate, he said uh, he, it felt to him as whimsical as the lighter moments of Elric, but with a Fritz Liber protagonist. And yeah, I'd yeah. say that hits the it, bullseye for me as well. That's really important, too, because I'm always saying as this bullshit thing that I don't actually mean, you know, you just say this thing and you think you believe it, is that like I don't like whimsy so much. And it's not that I'm not attracted to it, but when it hits, it just really hits well for me. Oh, I know. I mean, I'm the guy who always wants kind of like more sort of scarcity of things in stories, particularly when it comes to magical elements. And then, you know, I'll say that the next day I read something that's over the top bursting with magical elements and I'll really love it. So, you know, what yeah, can you say? It, we it, all have trends in our reading, but we, we shouldn't be absolutist about it. 
Yeah. And it's that the voice is so strong, right? It, it carries, like, I don't care how fantastical you get with it if I'm compelled by the voice, which then makes me compelled by the characters, right? Exactly. The voice was absolutely the thing that hooked me. Mm-hmm. Just the, 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 like, sort of voce commentary that he makes throughout, even just, like, his, his observation that, like, well, there's no use for him being in this bar because there's no mead left. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, and I'll that. add one thing from the chat here before we move on to uh, Graham, uh, which is uh, Eric is pointing out quite well. He says, I must say the contrast between the whimsy of Morlock being shrunken down and the surprisingly graphic fates of some of the bees really adds texture to the story. And that's true, right? This sort of contrast of tone and some of the stuff that's happening. I mean, that's, you know, yeah, that's that's how you get some good texture. Um, all right. So maybe we should uh, hear uh, from the guy who edited the story, or perhaps was one of the, there's a one in three chance actually edited. I, I should mention OMQ has a, a team of three editors. Uh, Graham, uh, where, was it you who edited the story? And whether or not it was, uh, what were your impressions? Uh, Jul- Julian and I edited it together. Uh, and by the way, can you all hear me? Okay. And then what was your sort of first impressions as a reader? Well, I was impressed. So this is this was. I think I might be the only one here where this is not my first introduction to Morlock. I first read my my the first Morlock story I read was the Singing Spear, in uh ah I see. How is that? There you go. Okay. That's much better. It, yeah. Okay. Oh the, yeah. Yeah yeah. The first uh. Morlock story that I uh, read. Sorry, the first Morlock story I read was The Singing Spear that came out in Swords and Dark Magic, which was edited by Jonathan Strahan and Lou Anders. That came out in about 2012, I think. It has some really great stories. It has a starts out with one from Gene Wolfe, which I feel like is always a high point for, or, you know, an attractive quality for an anthology to have. Yes. Anyways. That story is very similar in the sense that it starts out with Drunk Morlock having some, uh, I would say, ribald thoughts about what's going on around him, and then getting stuck into a very magical and sort of interesting situation that he comes up with a sort of off-color solution to. So when I read Evil Honey, I was and I was ex- I, I loved that story when I first read it, and so when I read Evil Honey, I was very excited because it felt to me like it captured that same feeling of almost picaresque kind of. I guess fun or or wackiness to it, but I felt like it also had, like Eric said in the chat, some chewier qualities to it that I felt elevated it above some of the other more whimsical or wacky stories that we see in submissions. Which I would say, having been first reader now at Old Moon for the past however many issues, um, I think all of them except for issue one, maybe I can't remember if I did issue two. Doesn't matter. Um, we get a lot of these sort of more Liber or Vance-esque stories, more than you might think. And a lot of them try to go for that same kind of whimsical or humorous tone. And in my opinion, it's very hard to nail it. But I think James Eng has, if not mastered it, come very close to doing so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that um, that came to mind just as you were describing that in terms of like threading the particular needle that this story does really well, um, is that that old um, John Scalzi saw um, the failure mode of clever is asshole. <laughs> and this story is 100% clever. <laughs> so <laughs> yes. you don't have to worry about that part, but like it takes a lot of skill to get to that point. This story is 100% clever is so goddamn true. And like, I don't know if I'm just being romanced by that part of it. And like I'm accepting of the weird B stuff, or if I like the entire package, but it doesn't matter because I like the entire package, you know. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think one thing that really helped it for me is that it has a very clear sort of thematic through line. You know, something that can make whimsical stories not work for me is the feeling that they're all just surface whimsy, right? That there's no actual like big idea mm-hmm. or anything that's being explored. And it just seems to me like there's a kind of good run through of, of essentially choosing between um, freedom and power, right? I mean, it's kind of spelled out on page 12, 
where the god, uh, Snatrick Summit, Summit Poe, the bee god, who doesn't like his own name, but in another great moment of whimsy, uh, basically says to Warlock, you know, I, yeah, I'm starting to see it. You can't be threatened and you can't be bought, but you don't like restrictions on your freedom. Well, listen to me, mortal. I'm restricting your freedom. And we kind of take it from there and again, to, you know, some of the more obvious things like the queen is obviously not free, but has all the power in the hive. And, you know, yeah, I think uh, the way the story is ultimately resolved by creating an enclosure. I don't know. Do you, do you think there's any meat on those bones or am I just uh, daydreaming here? There's got to be meat on those bones, whether it's... Uh whether it's intended or not, which I suspect it has to be on. I don't know. It, it depends on the writer, right? I, I think for, for some people it's that these, the meat on the bones uh, is there on purpose or it's, you start writing a thing and then you get the idea to put the thing in the thing. Um, there's so many ways it could go. So I feel like the meat on the bones is ultimately, uh, I don't know. For me, I feel like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's very no, go for it. Absolutely, that, that was <laughs> that was definitely the first thing I was going to say. <laughs> so, um, it is very subjective, but um, I felt like all of the pieces that were were present in the story, like they felt like they were purposeful, even when they were very very silly. Um, mm. The one thing, the, honestly, like the one that that kind of stumped me was the the um, the demigod's name. Um, and the only thing I could work out is that it was Optimus backwards and then some other word that is so like I, I, I googled a bunch of, of combinations on that to see if I could figure out if it was an anagram of something and I couldn't come up with anything but uh, it was uh, it, like all of the pieces were otherwise tied together really well which is I think um, a credit to this particular story that like all of the elements felt like they were there for a reason. Like it didn't have anything excessive or um, like it felt extraneous to me. Uh -huh. That's where I should have come in and said extraneous. <laughs> right. Yeah. We got to work ended. on our timing. <laughs> yeah. it's. You know what? I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work very well. Yes. Uh, Graham, I mean, how did you feel when you were going through it? Was it were, you know, is it something that's on your mind when you're reviewing stories for Old Moon Quarterly? Like, is there where's the theme? Where's the big ideas? Or do you just kind of like go through the story once or twice and then see what bubbles up later? It depends on the story. I think with this story, I felt like I I could bite into some themes that were present but weren't necessarily overwhelming in stupid volume. My apologies. I could bite into some themes that weren't overwhelming, but they were present. And I think part of that is my familiarity with the character. So I think one thing is there's some obvious political commentary going on in the story itself in relation to uh, current political climate in United States of America, um, which I thought was was humorous, and and actually Julie and I had different differing interpretations of what that political commentary was. We can get into that later. Both are fine, but the the other thing that I liked is that I think you get a very good sense of Morlock's, I suppose, ethos as a sword and sorcery character through his actions. This sound is very frustrating to me. I apologize. You get a, a very good sense of who he is as a character through the way that he acts, which I know is something that like Howard Andrew Jones and Brian C and J I'm sorry John C. Hawking have discussed in their own work that they like seeing characters who display who they are through their actions rather than through their internal monologue. And I think Morlock hits a nice stride with both, where we have those humorous sides and some elements of internal monologue that give us a sense of who he is, but he also acts in a way that leaves us in no doubt where he is and what his sort of values are so i think one of the turning points in the story that really appealed to me is when the character that the bee that he is like friends with or like the one that he first meets and is kind of showing around like the guard bee when she gets betrayed and killed by the kind of the engineer bees who are living down in Apologies. So when he 
meets the engineer bees and they murder the one bee that he's friends with, to me that felt like a turning point where Morlock decides, oh, okay, I'm going to solve this issue for them in the way that they deserve. And it isn't just, I'm going to murder everyone, which I do feel like is a common kind of swords and sorcery character uh, plot development, I would say, that I do read quite often. Um, and perhaps I've written my, myself once or, once or twice, but I appreciate how clever Morlock is, but also how principled he is. And I think it, it resonates with me what Jay and, John, and, and Matt both said about the failure point for clever is asshole, and Morlock doesn't fall into that despite being very clever. That's what I have, I suppose. Uh, thank you for that, Graham. Okay, uh, I just saw something interesting in the chat that I would like to share with anyone listening, uh, which is thrown up by user Bergy here. Apologies to anybody who can hear my puppy in the background. <laughs> We're all having fun audio stuff tonight. I do. I uh, hear it. That's, it. that's cute, man. She's so teething. Funny. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Um, so yeah, uh, Berge shared in the chat. Uh, he said in regards to the name of the bee god. Uh, he says I had to look it up myself. Angie explained it in a comment on Blackgate, and then follows with the quote from Angie, saying, "Snatrix Samitpo is based on Aristeus, the god of beekeeping in Greco-Roman myth. I had a little trouble naming him. I tried translating his Greek name, meaning best in the contest, into Latin." Optimus Sertans. That wasn't right. Then I tried reading it backwards, and it was even worse. Snatrek Summit Po. So bad that it was weirdly good. Finally, I figured I'd make it into a bit between him and Warlock. Okay, so there we go. Nice little bit of extra background on the story. Yeah, that um, checks out with why I was like, this has to mean something. I, <laughs> as I've said, uh, I attempted several different ma modes to google it and uh i came up with optimus prime curtains because uh <laughs> google is currently trying to uh sell me a lot of things because of black friday <laughs> maybe it's about that 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 was a joke <laughs> you know what it's funny you gotta uh, have the a more signal. yeah well, the, the more you guys talk about it, um, the more it's jogging my memory. Um, it was like a month ago, but I, there was, my, my month has been so busy in so many different directions that like my memories hurt. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I think there's definitely messages. I just can't remember what I took from it, you know? It happens like that sometimes. Yeah. I have, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, might even uh, differ on the day, right? Might even differ on the day when you read it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've I've yeah. had to read a lot of slush between the first time I read this and the most recent time I've read it. So, um, mm -hmm. trying to like just churn all of the all of the words out of my brain so that I can focus is is a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I I completely sympathize with that. Like, oh yes, that thing that I remember I really liked, and I completely forgotten about until just now. yeah it's exactly and i could get into other things of like you know uh, just things that have occurred in life as to why certain things just don't take priority or something your memory's like ah that was wicked and that's the part i remember i will i will return to it someday and rediscover why i liked it you know absolutely well, hey, I mean, coming back to the thing of uh, language and how carefully thought out uh, the name of the bee god was, you know, do you think sometimes, like, like how do you... <laughs> so there's, there's something else in here uh, that makes me wonder about the backstory, if there is one. On page 16, when the battle begins with what seems to be a couple of human beekeepers looming over the whole situation like giants, uh, you know, mm -hmm. driving yellow golden classic bees into the hive of the rib bees to cause a conflict... Well, with his little improvised wings that Morlock ends up making, he flies into battle and he screams while it goes, Kai Gradara, he screamed. He didn't know what B said as they plunged into battle. <laughs> like, right away, I love the irreverence of like, I don't know, I, he said something, whatever, who knows what bees do. Um, but it also makes me wonder about the words Kai Gradara, you know, did Engi do some sort of very well thought out sort of process as he did with the bee god's name? Or was it just kind of like, you know what, the character doesn't know what he's saying, why should anybody else know what he's saying, I don't care what he's saying, come up with something that sounds enough like a battle cry and chuck it in there, you know, it yeah, makes I, me wonder I, sometimes about... I would love to ask him, 
that, right? Like, I, I feel like <laughs> it strikes me as a bit of a vibe, but also rooted in something else. You know what I mean? Like a, a something specific. Well, I just like, think it's I, fun with fantasy names, right? Because especially in Sword and Sorcery, where like sometimes people are very methodical and they're like, okay, everything in this is going to be basically, you know, ancient Romans with the, you know, the details filed off or yeah, sometimes oh, yeah. they'll be like, I, I don't care. I'm I just do, do anything. Yeah. I, I or, or they do might that. Or they might be like, I'm just going to do names that are just like a bunch of consonants slammed together or whatever. They're a warrior race, and you wind up with something vaguely sounding like Klingon, but with no actual underlying structure. <laughs> or just going with what sounds cool. You know, I mean, for me, a lot of the time it comes out of just like an idea with a character. Something I'm outlining right now has a character who is essentially a nihilist in a way that's very juvenile and irritating. So his name is Ligotti, spelled backwards, because I am not impressed <laughs> by what I've read of Thomas Ligotti. I'm sorry to those who like him. Oh, wow. It's possible I haven't read the right book. But I read his um, sort of philosophical horror book, uh, and um, which name escapes me, of course, right now. It's like Crimes Against Humanity or something like that. And uh, yeah, it didn't, didn't, didn't blow my socks off. So I am having a bit of a goof because it makes sense for things to do with my story to have a character who is a you know, sort of juvenile nihilist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But that's just a you know poke for me, right? Unless somebody actually bothers to put the name you know the right way around, not realizing that it is until they do so, it'll it all, all it is is just some syllables you know slapped together, right? There's no grand backstory, there's no Latin or anything. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy against the human race. Uh, I'm getting from the chat here. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it uh, it didn't do it for me, but we're not here to discuss that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. This yeah, makes my point yeah, is that works yeah. Well. I, I wonder about the intentionality and, uh, you know, in, in Enki's story, is it all as intentional as the bee god's name or is Kai Gradara, he didn't know what bee said, you know, is that just him being like, ah, fuck well, it, I don't have yeah. a big backstory here. <laughs> oh, my reading of Sometimes. that was definitely like, I don't know what, like, it, my reading of it at the time was definitely like that he, because he had been transformed at least to bee size, he was coming up with like uh, something, something new. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. That was my that was my I favorite. love I love one thing that I like I love the mythic the mythic quality of it where it's like oh he needs wings so he just builds them and he's good. It's like Icarus. <laughs> it's like ah oh, I just slapped together some wings with clay and uh you know whatever the <laughs> the other thing was. Oh that well the it, the, it, the it brushes over those details. Was so yes, yeah. just effortless. Just go for it. Get to it. It's like the story is about like yeah, exactly some some observations about life that he's making um, that are left to your interpretation. And then it's wrapped up in this just fun, almost cotton candy situation. Uh, it, it's, cotton it's candy. And yet, and yet, you know, we maintain mm -hmm. this thing of sword and sorcery protagonists do not have to be necessarily likable or full on capital H heroes. That's what heroic fantasy is for. Right. Um, because mm. on page 20, I think it's really notable that Morlock does not interfere when he walks past the chamber where the golden bee is being tortured in a way that is described in enough detail to make clear that it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty wretched. Did that change yeah, how many of you saw a, the character or? Yeah, I, I, I do. Yes, that man, you're actually just jogging my memory. I remember that thinking, oh shit, he just went right. Yeah, no, didn't, didn't have time for it. Um, and again, as my first brush with the character, there was something for me, I actually appreciate that. And it's just because I'm drawn to like darker explorations sometimes. And so if you have characters that, I don't know if, if that becomes a, uh, like they're tested and they just go, yeah, whatever. I'm on my own shit. And someone who drinks a lot, you know, if, if, yeah. if someone's drinking all the time, there's certain things that are not paying attention to because anyone who's doing a thing all the time for kicks, like every day, um, it's going to affect certain things. You're not going to see certain things. There's parts of you that will be blunted. And like, I think that measures up really well with his character that he's just, ah, move past it. I've written things like that in characters too, where it's, you know, you get the sense that this is going to be a good person, but they're in a snap of their life where they're at least in part consumed by, you know, a nagging addiction. Um, mm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's what it kind of uh, yeah shot at me. No, for sure, and I mean you definitely get the sort of contrast too. Like I mean, I'm thinking of something else here that like is funny and then dark and then dark and funny at the same time. This whole thing yeah. of the hive being whipped up about bears, who 
you know, you're, he could almost go too too wild and whimsical here and kind of lose the tone a little bit by getting into like Winnie the Pooh nonsense, right? But because there's this idea of like, <laughs> oh, the bears, you know, they want our honey. But then you get this part on page 25 where Warlock is going down through the levels of the hive, uh, you know, being brought to the makers at the bottom to fulfill this whole thing that leads to the resolution of the story. And as it sort of quickly lists what he sees on various floors, we eventually get to one where uh, it's like, um, you know, in one cell, beelings were learning a song in praise of the queen or wisdom. In the next one, bees wore brown, bear-like masks may- and made grunting sounds obscene to Morlock's bee-sized mm. ears. And then it just keeps moving mm-hmm. as we go through floor to floor. And it just makes me wonder, like, it's sort of like, what is going on on that floor? <laughs> You know, this sort of dark yeah. propaganda or conditioning, or is this some, you know, the beginning, you know, the beginning of some new torture or some new uh, radical cell because this, the obviously order in this hive is breaking down a little bit. And it just was like really unnerving, even though there'd been a vague allusion to Winnie the Pooh kind of on only the previous page with the meeting with the queen and all that stuff. Oh, so, see, for me with the, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, for me with the barrier bits, um, I, I read that as very much like allegory about American politics. <laughs> About oh, ranting, there. ranting about barriers it. and um, building the yeah, barriers. Yeah, yeah, the walls. Yeah, it was yeah, very yeah, obvious yeah, yeah. analog. <laughs> there is actually a line I wanted to pull out here, too. They Please. hate the barrier and they hate the hive. Destroy them if you, and there's a break there. If you can't, you must be evil, too. The hive is great and will be greater. And if some bees don't like that, well, then. And that just, like, <laughs> I, I had to highlight that one because I was like, well, that's yeah. not subtle. <laughs> That's probably very, it's probably verbatim in a few sections, right? Like, I, yeah, I there's can't definitely some moments where I was like, yep, that, uh, that yeah, is yeah, a yeah, commentary yeah. on the contemporary yeah. state. And that yeah. is, it's, oh my God, <laughs> it's coming back to me. All of this is coming back to me now. But, I, but it was I, yeah, done so I wanted... skillfully, I couldn't even be mad about it. <laughs> no, no, exactly. No, it, that's actually a really good point because that stuff, you know, it was just like, oh, this is really... a pun, but. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you're also exhausted by the sort of talk of a particular person. And so then when it shows up and the other thing, you're like, I know, man, you don't get to preach to the choir, but it's like, <laughs> for something like that, it's if it yeah, really it was, freaking it was, works, man. It works. Masterfully done. I agree. Yeah. I think it's something to be um, said when the sort of themes and big ideas are in, just incredibly easy to pick up, but that's not read as ham fisted. It's just a story that's being very mm-hmm. clear on top of being yeah. very entertaining. There's a I real think. deafness to being to being able to do that. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to know you can't overstay your welcome. You got to move in. You got to be clever. It's like a it's like a well played uh, hockey play or there's something in it. <laughs> there's an ice metaphor here, you guys. Like just gliding along, and I'm waxing uh, weirdly art school uh, philosophical here, guys. I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, Graham, sorry. I feel like we've been kind of dominating for a little bit here. You know, how did you um, how did you feel about the ending? Because I, I rather uh, enjoyed it. You know, the whole thing of him getting to, you know, resolving the issue, growing back to being grown back to human size. And it's arguable whether or not he gets the girl with uh, the bee god's mom. But certainly he gets to go back to drinking, which is all he seemed to really want to do at the very beginning of the story. So we get this nice closed loop almost. Um, and tonally that too, it can be read as kind of like a cynical thing with like, oh, well, you know, we left behind all this terror and horror or just kind of a fun, almost Warner Brothers, you know, we're done and we're out. Um, how, how did it read to you the ending? You're going to have to remind me. (laughs) No, the, the ending to me read uh excuse me apologies so the ending to me i recall i I quite enjoy it to me it read almost sardonically i thought it was a man i really hate my sound currently to me it read like uh, i apologize i'm watching i'm watching the sound stop stop working as i speak sorry man okay no it's all right all right i'll just keep talking Okay, so to me, the sound, the um, the ending read uh, sardonically, which I like. I thought that it was it was fun to go from these sort of headier themes 
of you know in group out group you know the political the the more outward political allegory uh that that we mentioned earlier you know morlock's um belief and uh kind of abiding faith in friendship kind of you know he he wasn't really friends with this bee but they hit, but he saw it get betrayed he had this relationship to it and he avenged her in a in a way that made sense to him um so i i liked how it went from there back to kind of like that start of the story where it was more humorous and we get a sense of morlock as somebody who is almost above it all and i think that this go i, I think one thing that enhanced my reading of the ending and made me like it so much was that I'm familiar with more of the Eng stories, and in them, there is sort of so Morlock is immortal in the sense that he doesn't age, and so Eng plays with that. And there are kind of three distinct periods of Morlock's life that Eng writes about one when he's quite young and he's trying to join a sort of uh magical order of uh. Elrics, I guess you would call them, like magical sorcerer warrior type people who rule a sort of anarcho commune of other sorcerers called the Great of Guardians. Um, and while he's doing that, he's also raised by dwarves. Uh, so it's, there's a whole lot going on. But so he's kind of a, a very earnest, very serious young man in those stories. Eventually, a whole bunch of shit happens. Uh, broadly speaking, and he becomes an alcoholic. And that's sort of the middle point of his life, and that's where a lot of the short stories take place, is uh, Morlock as this sort of ruined alcoholic who has trouble with his drinking. And like Matt said, it leads him to to blunt himself to a lot of issues that he might otherwise have um, reacted to when he was younger. He might have tried to fix them. And now he's he has a sort of abiding cynicism that I think can be interesting because he balances it with he tries to resist the the calls to action that he he gets um, and he never is quite able to you know or else there would be a story and then there's a third section of his life that the, the the novels tend to deal with which is where he ceases being an alcoholic and he stops drinking altogether um, and he be, he becomes more of a a sort of uh, heroic fantasy style character perhaps some he, he's a little bit more serious um and has less of that sort of humorous aside that we might see in this story and he becomes more of a almost like a hanovar style character trying to go out there and right wrongs and he ends up in a, in a, a long-term conflict with his father merlin who is a uh i guess one might uh kindly term him uh, a jackass um <laughs> So yeah, so so I guess my background knowledge in that sense helped me appreciate the story for the different looks it gives of Morlock and the way Ang plays with that character kind of over time. Oh well, that's really fascinating. Thank you for that background, Graham, because I've read sort of scattered Morlock stories and. I've noticed like what felt to me like a change in the overall tone, of, you know, and missions that you got involved with and so on. So now I have a bit more context for that. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Okay. So I just want to sort of quickly go around uh, one more sort of light question. And I think, in, again, in honor of the Kickstarter, uh, I'll bring it back to you, Graham. And eventually I think we're going to have you maybe discuss what made this an old moon quarterly story and what is, you know, sort of quote unquote, the platonic <laughs> old moon quarterly story to give people who are, you know, maybe hearing the magazine for the first time uh, an idea of what to look for. But before we get to that, yeah, like I said, I just want to mention some favorite lines because yeah, I think, you know, Angie knows how to turn a sentence. Yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in here. I particularly enjoy, for example, um, you know, the way he describes the shrinking from Warlock's perspective and you get a little bit of, you know, uh, oh, the boy-shaped god seemed newly impressive. In fact, he was towering against the sky. Morlock didn't realize what was happening, and this is what I love so much, until he was punched under the chin by a dandelion. What a fun yeah. way to describe someone being <laughs> shrunk. Yeah. Was Just there the any contrast line to or description? A, a, that... a, flower, a flower punching you is like, <laughs> it's, it's already just... It paints uh, a picture. Oxy, oxy, oxymoron sort of situation too, right? Of like, you don't yeah, think of a flower then... as hurting you in any way. They're <laughs> lovely. They're soft. They have little fuzzy bees on them, man. 
It's just a weird <laughs> contrast of imagery for me. Yeah, and then like the the back end when he gets grown up, uh, you know, sort of grown up to full size again, and he's looking at the woman who is essentially the god's mum, and remarks upon how strange it is to see a woman who doesn't look like a bee. <laughs> You know, this idea of this lingering, you know, this, you know, perceptual thing from his experience. So, yeah, like even this sort of very simple thing that uh, I think a lesser writer might just sort of go, well, you got smaller and you got bigger, you know, more or less. Um, we, we get some fun insight into how the experience has discombobulated him a little bit. Um, so, yeah, like that was something that was out to me. Jay, were there any uh, turns of phrase or descriptions or anything like that that you particularly liked? Oh, I mean, I, I mentioned it before, but the line that literally caught my attention and was like, okay, yes, I need to follow through and find out what's going on with this guy is a place with no drink was no place for Morlock to left. Yes. Like, it was just such a good, tight, crisp little way of saying it. Exactly. Like, there are a lot of ways you could, there are a lot of ways you could phrase a sentence like that, but that specific phrasing demonstrates so specifically what this character is like. And that was like, okay, yeah. all right, I'm in. <laughs> that's when when I said I wish I wrote it. That's that's the line I had in mind, and I couldn't I couldn't even paraphrase it at the time. But I was like, it's so succinct and gets to the character so quickly. And it's like, it's also the way I have trouble writing. If there's like one frontier in my own writing that I really need to explore, it's that I got to get that pith down. But I don't know. Maybe I don't even right. I, I leave it to the people who are good at it, <laughs> like like James Enge. You know, yeah, but it can be fun to play in sandboxes that are not necessarily your expertise yet. Question mark. Pip is fun, man. Problem, I, I, Oliver. It, it, this story made me want to play in that. You know, absolutely. I know, but playing in sandboxes, as you know, if you had a sandbox at all outside <clears throat> ever when you were a kid, there was always <laughs> a chance of digging up cat poops. I mean, I don't know. I played in playgrounds that, like, you know, were monitored by people who cared about the children. <laughs> <laughs> but the cats don't I'm care kidding. about the children, yeah. Oliver. The cats don't care. They, you know. I, I, <laughs> sorry, there's a bit I'm of a Canadian I, rivalry here. I'm, I'm mocking the maritime. I was just going to say, this is that American culture thing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, this is... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's also that, like, I got to bring a little rogues in the house to the situation where I have to talk about poop or something. Something lowbrow, at least for a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. It's a cultural exchange. Um <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so so man, I know you had a kind of a brain fr frazzling day, but was there any particular turn of phrase, description, that kind of thing that really stuck out to you? No, I mean Jay Wolf's uh, uh it, like that's it. That that's that's the best line in the story. I mean, and I don't mean that there's no other good ones. I just mean that it's it's the cut glass Dirk Diggler of the situation. I love it. <laughs> right on. Sorry, I'm just laughing at the invocation of Boogie Nights. I know you uh, get. I know yeah, you get that. So, yeah. you know, Boogie Nights. Boogie Nights, Conan the Barbarian, and Alien. That's my trifecta, baby. Those well, good, man. I was, I was watching Alien 3 before I came on here. Um, so, okay. Were you really? Uh, oh, no, for real. Yeah, I, was, I, I, I just got to the funeral for uh, the two characters from Alien <sighs> so that uh, people were upset about. Uh, I love um, I But love anyway. Alien 3. Yeah. <laughs> uh okay so uh graham uh, would you mind i'm gonna hit you up for sort of two things in a row here but we'll start with uh, the easier one was there a particular like favorite turn of phrase or description in this story that is not my puppy teething in the background it is your poor puppy i can't i just tuned into it uh certainly um so jay wolf did jay wolf and matt both uh spoke about one that i did really enjoy but there was uh, uh i think his dialogue morlock's dialogues with uh zarook the kind of guardy that he met and became friends with those were some of my favorite parts of the story and there's one right towards the end right before zarook gets uh you know uh knifed or uh, stung to death i suppose uh spoiler um that i thought it really amused me because one, it's a it's a humorous part. It's a humorous kind of dialogue, and two, it does some really good work building that he do, that Aang does throughout. That I feel like mm. it, it's 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 perfect. Anyways, I'll just I'll just read it. I'll stop talking about it. I am Morlack Ambrosius, he said, and you're a male. Zeruk buzzed in wonder. Are you absolutely sure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, adjusting my sound. Well, Zeruk said loyally, I never would have guessed it. <laughs> so what, 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 what it's what what i what i of aliens 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> what, Do you what remember I like what we're talking about? Yep. What, what, what Sorry, like... carry on. I, I will invoke it later. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Uh, what I like about it is, you know, obviously the bees are almost all women because they're bees, and so. But Eng doesn't take any, doesn't take time to explain, you know, what are the what's the social organization of the hive? What are what's the bee culture like? You know, he doesn't do any of that. He just makes some jokes about, you know, the bees keep mistaking more, or at least Zurich keeps mistaking more like for a girl because, she, you know, the bee thinks that because she because her and all of her comrades are women, she values them more. And so she thinks because Morlock, she seems to like Morlock, she thinks he must also be a girl. And so, you know, it just says a whole lot about what the bee dynamics are, I guess, in that thing, in the, in that culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he doesn't have to, you know, he just doesn't have to spend a lot of time. He doesn't go on like a Sanderson style, here's what I'm talking about sort of thing. He just, you know, he adds these little tidbits in and I, and I, and I like it. And I, and I find he does it in this, through this humorous dialogue, which is, it's just something that, that always appeals to me. I think it's oh, that was another one I had highlighted. Like, <laughs> I love that. I love that it was obviously a high compliment. That was kind of like that was a, a neat inversion on the like, the the whole uh, gender gender guess situation. That it was that it was an obvious compliment was was a neat little trick of world building. Yes, yeah. I think oh, yeah. one thing that that I feel like uh, Ang does well is he does play with gender in a few of his works in some very fun ways that, that I think some of you would, would quite enjoy. There's a, one of his novels, and they're all standalone, so you don't really, there's not really much of a canon other than, you know, Morlock doesn't drink in some of them. Um, there's one where he hmm. goes to a city in the far north of his fantasy world that's, in, that's uh, populated by werewolves. And there's some fun, uh, I would say, gender, uh, gender role dynamics that are explored in there. In relation to the, the sort of werewolf people that he speaks to, um, and the were and a werewolf god that he interacts with, that I thought was very fun. Um, so I thought I would just uh, shout, I, I suppose, uh, shout that out and mention it because I think a lot of people would would enjoy that if they enjoyed sort of the 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 pithiness and the some of the the themes that were present in this story. You might see some of their echoes in that novel. I can't I can't quite recall what the name of it is now, but I can look it up. That's rad. I, I had awesome. I had to mention the bit like for Oliver because he mentioned Alien Three. I had to quickly mention Aliens, Aliens, the Vasquez <laughs> joke, right? You know what I'm talking yep. about, right? Yep. yep hey, yep. yo, Vasquez, you ever been mistaken for a man? <laughs> no, have you? Man, we quoted that so much when we were kids, and uh, it had that energy. <laughs> I thought. Because Vasquez was so badass, right? She was so badass. Anyways, carry on. Yes. <laughs> okay. So so I really want to, like I say, because of the case order, I really want to give Graham uh, some space at the end here, and we're getting near the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do final thoughts with us other three, and then we'll go to Graham. So yeah, uh, Jay, what are your final thoughts on Evil Honey? Um, I feel like I, I feel like I've covered everything that I really had um, on my mind with this story. Um, it, I'm definitely going to have to look into the other stories just to sort of round out uh, my knowledge of this character, just because I'm kind of fascinated by the 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 range that um, that he has in the material that Graham has been describing. So I'm actually really curious to find out more there. Um, I think that's going to be my main takeaway here, really. <laughs> Right on. And Matt, do you have any sort of final thoughts uh, about the story that you want to share? Uh, I mean, honestly, the same for me, though, is is uh, to read more, right? Because it just, I really like this. I think I wrote on the Discord, you know, the day after I read it. And the truth is, I haven't been reading a lot of short fiction. Um, yeah. So I'm excited to dip back into it. It's like, like The Magician's Skull, right? A magazine I love, and I love leafing through it. But I've read snatches of it over the courses of, like... You know, uh, I have almost all of the issues, but I have so many of those uh, of Morlock stories banked in there. Mm -hmm. Like, I I'm really excited to uh, to dig into them. I also want to say, guys, it's a pleasure talking to you, uh, Jay Wolf. I don't think uh, we've ever spoken. It was a pleasure. 
and also uh graham yeah graham as well it's nice to meet you guys in a virtual space um i would also maybe we can use this as a segue of sorts but uh I would love for people to get on there and uh, support Old Moon Quarterly. I mean, when these Kickstarters come up on um, for, for sword and sorcery stuff and the offers are so good and people are exhausted by, you know, big box situations or perhaps even giant publishers not seeing that particular thing that they want. Um, it's really awesome if people can put their money where their mouth is in terms of what they want. And if not even that, if you just dig what someone's doing, chuck them some dollars um, I'm saying all this, yes, I'm in, uh, one of these upcoming issues of this, but I'm not, I've already, you know, I've been compensated for my efforts. I've not, uh, <laughs> I'm not gaining more. So I'm just saying su support these things. If you can throw the shekels, I mean, it's, it's hard out there, I think, uh, lately, but yeah, well, man. I mean, certainly for anybody who pays attention yeah, to what's been going on with the short fiction, uh, publications yeah. this last yeah. year. Yeah, I don't yeah, need to yeah, go on yeah. at length because it's been discussed elsewhere at length. Um, but yeah, things like the Amazon Kindle fiasco and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and but, it's, uh, it's it's a similar it's a similar sense of like you know when people say shop local, right? To me, it's like shop a little indie, do a little indie shopping too. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, and I totally same, agree with that. But same, I would also push vibe. hard on the fact that um, it's not just like I don't know some sort of social good to support these things. They're great because it's in these realms that you can find people really doing stuff that, as you say, you can't find as easily elsewhere. Uh, if you want to find I'm only a underselling distinct it because flavor, of my, you know, it's because of my own oh, yeah. uh, imposter syndrome that I'm I'm underselling uh, <laughs> that that aspect. I'm in it. I wouldn't read that. Yes. <laughs> well, I am, I am not only not in the magazine and therefore have no bias as such. Um, I actually did an editing pass on the story of yours that's going to be in Old Moon Quarterly, so I will say it's a great story. Oh, that's... And people, sh that's people should back right. the magazine for many reasons. One of them is to read your particular tale. I, I will also say that um, as someone who edits his own Sword and Sorcerer magazine and who pays a lot of attention to the scene as a result of that, uh, it really pleases me to see a sort of, you know, diverse um, stylings within this scene of sword and sorcery you know if we were all trying to do our best imitations of just you know lancer conan era stuff or whatever uh that would be boring and so it don't would tempt me, me happy don't tempt see... me <laughs> i mean i love that flavor but i'm just saying it's like having it's like if everything was just out of the same flavor that'd be boring obviously so one thing that i've always really enjoyed in reading old moon is that I always know I'm reading Old Moon magazine. You know what I mean? I, I rarely feel when I'm reading it, oh, that I could have read this anywhere. No, it's 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 Old Moon. It's got its own distinct flavor, uh, sort of broader Five, definition baby. of sword and sorcery than I myself would use. And that's good because, again, we want diverse opinions on these things. Uh, and that broader thing does allow for uh, all kinds of neat uh, flavors and stories that I wouldn't have predicted to even encounter, including this tale, uh, to be honest. So, uh, yeah, no, I really, really uh, love the story. And I really dig Old Moon Quarterly. And I hope it goes for... Uh, you know, Old Moon Quarterly, Rick and Morty, 100 years, however that goes, <laughs> 100 issues, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, but these are my feelings. Um, and now I'm going to just kick it over to Graham to wrap it up for us. Uh, well, I'll do the final sign off, but to essentially end the conversation by telling us, Graham, could you give us, and I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, so just do your best. Don't don't feel, you know, I've got you under a spotlight. If someone asked you, as I'm literally about to do here broadly speaking what would you say is old moon quarterly's flavor you know us three have all fumbled around trying to describe it but i mean you're one head on the three-headed you know hydra of uh, the magazine what would you say is old moon quarterly's flavor if people come and check it out if people come and uh, buy an issue off amazon issues one through five are available right now folks uh, or if they go to the kickstarter to back it and support future issues like what's what roughly can they expect from old moon quarterly uh certainly so I think the, the one of the number one things that we look at is bros. So I know that Julian and Caitlin and I are all very fond of works that have unique pros or pros that is perhaps something that you wouldn't necessarily see in another uh, magazine or perhaps in, in a novel that, that comes out recently. Something that might go beyond a little bit beyond the window pane style of pros or at least something that has some voice to it that is distinctive. So I wouldn't say, you know, Eng's prose is not terribly ornate but it does have as matt and, and jay both pointed out and i think it's Oliver did as well it just has it has tremendous voice to it another thing that we love to look for are works that have 
some kind of, of thematic quality to them. You know, the themes don't have to be right out there on display. It doesn't have to be a work that's about, you know, quote unquote, DM, big ideas. But we do like works that have a little bit more of that quality to them. Um, you know, obviously this one had, a, had some of that direct political allegory in terms of the United States. It had, um, you know, perhaps one could read in some some sort of message about alcoholism. I don't know. But there are other stories that we've published that we feel touch on some themes that just spoke to us in some way. And so that's one thing that we do look for. Uh, another thing that I, I suppose that we that we look for are qualities that might tend a little bit towards the darker side of fantasy. We like works that are that focus on the tragic, that focus on character. When I say tragic, I mean it's kind of tragic in like the, the sense of like Greek mythology or you know the oft-touted northern thing that so many foundational sword and sorcery authors and fantasy authors like J.R.R. Tolkien or Paul Anderson or whomever were very fond of. That sort of, you know, a fight against a fatalistic universe where kind of everything is aimed against humanity and people might have to, you know, things might all end in blood and fire, but people still persevere and try to accomplish some goal, some worthy goal of their own, no matter what. So I think that's a quality that also stands out as something that we really like. I think in that same issue with James, James Eng's story, I think the, the story that comes right after it, uh, Knife Lace Prayer by T.R. Siebert, uh, she wrote a very lovely uh, story about a world that has been, has been abandoned by its God. And its God is in the process of destroying it and remaking a new world from its ashes. And two of his servants take umbrage at that and try and stop him, or at least get some answers from him. And that quality, you know, fighting against people who are very, very powerful, you know, whether they be gods or really strong political figures like kings or emperors, that's another thing that we off that I think crops up in our stories quite often, um, or that we look for. That being said, I don't know that there is. I wouldn't want to put anything hard and fast on what we're looking for in terms of oh we hate this and we'll never publish it one because i mean i'm only one of the three voices that selects things but also because sometimes there are stories that are very far out of the realm of what we normally like to read that somehow still speak to us in issue four for example there is a portal fantasy story by jen donahue that deals with a teenage woman or a uh, yeah, sure teenage woman who uh comes back from a sort of line wishing the wardrobe scenario. She gets sucked into a fantasy world and it begins with her being found again after she leaves that fantasy world. And she has all the memories of her life as, you know, an adult woman in that fantasy world. She comes back as a teenager and it's her uh, essentially coming to terms with the trauma and the, and the experience of having lived a full life and then coming back as a child um, or as adolescent rather. And it, it was, it's not normally what we publish. I'm not a huge fan of Portal Fantasy myself. Um, there was a sort of like, perhaps a, a, why, a, a sort of young adult quality to it as well that we normally don't go for. But something about the story, it just, the, the feeling that the character had, the voice that the character had, the sense of isolation that she felt, something about it just spoke to both Caitlin and I, and Julian to some extent too, obviously him being the chief editor. And even though we don't normally go for that sort of thing, we're like, man, this story is awesome. Let's go for let's you know let's grab it and 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 I'm glad we did one because that story I think that story deserved to be published though I think it could have been published elsewhere as well. Um, but also I've had numerous people uh, talk to me and say, man, I you know I didn't think that I would like that story when I first started reading it, but by the by the end of it, I think it was my favorite story in the collection. So I think that just speaks to, I, I guess, having a a Catholic in the sense of all encompassing. Uh, approach to, to some of this, not Catholic in the sense of the church, Catholic in the sense of like what the word means. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the ulterior, less used, very confusing definition that I just tried to oh, use. No, it's great. It was um, fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I guess it uh, did go you... right over my head. Oh, I felt guilt. I... It was just guilt, is what I felt. <laughs> the Catholic guilt. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so yes, we do have qualities that we like more, but I would say that there are, there, there's, we will give anything that is sent to us at least a read and a consideration. Yeah, you guys do have an admirable dedication to responding with some detail to all submissions. I, if I remember correctly, like you guys haven't done any form rejections yet, have you? 
Oh, no, we have. Yes, we we started doing form rejections. Once we started getting, uh, I think four hundred or five hundred submissions a submission period. Um, just yeah. be, just uh, I think it was the the explosion of AI submissions to also uh motivated us to start sending some more form uh rejections. And also, in, this is perhaps something that um that Jay might have more input on too, since I know she she does less reading for um for uncanny mm -hmm. um we did receive some feedback that people weren't necessarily looking for feedback on their work and they didn't find it terribly helpful that we were giving feedback and they would have preferred just to receive a form rejection and they would have preferred to receive a form rejection relatively quickly rather than wait for what they felt to be was less helpful feedback that and is so... yeah i would say that um between uncanny and um some anthology work that I've done, uh, I would say that, yeah, that that completely tracks with with my experience. I don't oh. give feedback unless it is something that I is like, this is a tangible thing you could fix to immediately sell this somewhere else. Um, or yeah. something where mm -hmm. it's like something where it's something like I can see the exact problem, even if it's not something I can offer like advice on how to fix. In general, I prefer not to give feedback, um, partially because I am an editor um, and I do a lot of dev work. So one of the things that I don't like to do is be too prescriptive with anybody who's not my client. Um, so what I usually prefer is to simply indicate like it's not for me. And um, I mean, at Uncanny, that's the baseline policy is that anybody that's coming through at my at my level if i'm if i'm sending a rejection it's going to be a form rejection but um for for mm -hmm. anthology work and things like that i prefer not to give feedback for that because my needs are generally very specific when i'm reading for an anthology and so what i have to say is not going to help them sell the story to someone else so i'm only going to give feedback if i think it's feedback that they will sell it somewhere else and that's a very rare that's a very uh, rare bean for me. <laughs> well, as someone who submits stories, um, that is that's that's appreciated. Like, okay, so three people who are either slushing or editing, uh, two of whom have edited me. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, yeah, so I'm in an interesting position, you see. <laughs> but like, do you feel that in some cases? If your immediate sense is that the prose is not up, I shouldn't say up, if the prose is not to the taste that you want and you know it immediately, I feel like that's a place where a form rejection can come in. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's that you want a, well, no, no, I, th I think, I think other than just shit that has mechanical problems, et cetera, et cetera, do you, um, do you know very quickly just due to voice and prose if it's what you want? Or are you like, ooh, that plot twist is really gonna get me? Because I would, I would never, I would never do slush. Okay, guys, I couldn't do it. It would destroy my soul. I know it would. I'd be too analytical. I, analysis paralysis would be everywhere. <laughs> I have, this is also. I, I'm hijacking the end of this show, by the way, because now I'm curious to talk to editors. That's all right. I, 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 as moderator, will make sure that uh, we'll, we'll end with Graham saying why the Kickstarter is awesome, and then we'll we'll, we'll cut the credits. <laughs> but this is some neat subject matter, so we can spend a couple minutes here. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I've, I'm in the position of having sent literally thousands of rejections. So um, I wow. hate to say wow. that I don't even think about it, but I kind of don't. Um, what I will say is Day that the Reaper. I, I, you kind of have to. You have to, you have to yeah. not care in a way that's sort of awful. And I hate it. Uh -huh. um, like, there is a part of me that literally hates sending every single rejection I've ever had to send. So, like, that's please human, know if though. you've ever received yeah. one from me, it was absolutely not personal, and I 100% want to see your next story. Mm -hmm. um, but at mm -hmm. the same time, it's just sort of like, there's just like a volume thing <laughs> that happens with short fiction, where it's like, you can kind of get to a point where, and it's it's not fair to anybody that like, well, if your first line isn't great, but like, the truth is, if, if your first night line isn't great, like, the odds that page five is great are... Yeah. Not always there. <laughs> please, please give a paragraph. My first line often has struggles. You guys, just give me the paragraph. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's a singular. Like I, I so far have been a coward and not opened uh, New Edition Sorcery to subs. Uh, I think I've said the reasons why I'm past recording, so I'll leave that out. 
I feel like eventually I do want to tackle it and that probably what will happen is a similar life cycle to what I've heard about with a lot of magazines where early on you give out a lot more formal feedback because A, you know as a writer you appreciate that and B, you're not dealing with as many submissions you get so it's more manageable. Um, but I, I think, you know, if and when that day comes for me, when that day comes for me, when I choose to give formal feedback, what I'll probably do is try and be like, here's feedback that if you want to keep submitting to my magazine, here's some guidance if you want to do something that's more likely to tickle me or something, you know, because that's like feedback I appreciate. It's not that I'm looking for um, sort of broad, uh, just dev editing for when I send uh, my stories into places uh, because that's so subjective. But if someone's like, well, you know, here at publication, we tend to prefer more of uh, this perspective or more of uh, this way of doing descriptions or something that I like because it feels more actionable to a specific place, right? As opposed to just a, a general, here's how to make your writing better, kid, which is, you know, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's yeah, my point. Nobody wants it. that advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's ultimately about like uh, if if you can maximize the use of people's time the best in terms of editor writer relationship right like the writer does certain things that save the editor time and if the editor is like yeah it would almost be good to have form rejections you can just move the process along more quickly while being respectful to the person who submitted you know so I, I say don't don't be afraid or guilty at all for form rejections. My God, I know I know it must sting slightly and feel not human and factory like, but the fact is you're out there doing slush, and God bless you for that. Not that I'm a a, a believer in yeah, no people. Yeah. I, I say Catholic guilt. I don't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on, guys. No, it's all good. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, yeah, we, we need our slush readers and we need to acknowledge their humanity. And I also think that all but the least mature uh, and least potentially experienced authors quickly get over the formal, pardon me, the form rejection thing. It just is what it is. And mm-hmm. maybe the better ones say, due to volume, this is a form letter, like just reminding people <laughs> like why it is. But whatever. Yeah, you know. Um, all right. So, I mean, that's, yeah, another that's a good point, actually. That one yeah. thing, that one thing is nice to say, hey, guys, sorry, it's impersonal, but here we go is what we have to do. Boom. Yeah, uh, it's not personal, it's business. Um, so, speaking of business, the business of Kickstarters and funding magazines, uh, Graham, take us out on a little bit of why people should go running to the Kickstarter, running away from my teething puppy, to back it immediately. Okay. Well, I think our Kickstarter, so we are, one, we're, we're, we're expanding the magazine, from 20, about 20,000 words a issue to 30,000 words an issue. We're also adding black and white interior art, which is the part that I'm most excited about. So one, uh, I suppose our aspirational goal for the magazine in terms of look and feel is definitely Tales from the Magician Skull, which if you haven't checked out, you should go check out uh, right now immediately. But they, we won't, I don't know that we will approach the beauty of that magazine just because of, you know, Howard and, and Lester, who's their layout guy, and, and Joseph Goodman have created a, a really refined and, and beautiful product. But we're trying to get there. And I think the first step is getting those interior illustrations. And I'm really happy with the interior illustrators we're working with. Our vibe, I think, is best described as if Albert Durer read lots of Warhammer novels and decided, that's what I want to draw. That's kind of what we're trying to get our artists to, to write with us. And that's kind of the stories that we're also going for. So if that appeals to you, if you feel like, hey, I haven't seen enough black metal album color al- album covers, I need more of them, and I need the stories that go along with those album covers, or I, you hear a new Dungeon Synth band, and you say, oh, man, they have a really, really cool name and really cool song titles, but I can't listen to synths. For 30 minutes just droning on i need swords and people getting killed then i think our magazine might be the <laughs> aesthetic that you are looking for because it mirrors that aesthetic with things that actually happen instead of just since droning on so i do love dungeon synth anyways <laughs> so beyond just the artwork and the expansion of word count i think that there aren't really any magazines out there currently that are hitting the vibe that we're hitting if you really like, if you love Dark Souls, or if you love Bloodborne, if you love the 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 manga Berserk, or its two decent anime adaptations, and for some reason you love the third really terrible one, either way, if those are works that you really resonate with, or if you really love Gene Wolfe and his book of the New Sun, 
or if you love Warhammer, but you are a little bit full of Warhammer novels themselves, then I think our magazine captures a lot of the darkness and the grittiness and the coolness of those settings, and they mirror it to something that we have an, that we have an eye for things that have some craft to them that might sometimes be lacking in game-based literature. Not always, but sometimes. And I think we nail a certain aesthetic in a certain voice that I feel people are out there and they want. And so you can't necessarily get that from Tales from Mission Skull. They're, they're more, I love what they do, and I think that they're, they're more oriented towards classic sword and sorcery. New Edge has its own, uh, I think, distinct voice, and it's, and it's a lovely and it's a great voice, but I think it's distinct from our own as well. And I think the other uh, magazines out there that are focused on, on Sword and Sorcery, Savage Realms Monthly, Sword and Sorcery Magazine, and so on and so forth, I think they all have their own distinct voices that aren't quite what we are doing. They don't have, they, whether they focus more on the grittiness or more on that classic Sword and Sorcery feel, I think none of them quite have the marriage of qualities that we're going for. And so I think that that uniqueness is something that if you want to see more of it out there, the only way you can do it is to contribute to our Kickstarter or to buy copies of the magazine. And the best way to get those copies of the magazine is definitely through the Kickstarter. And I think the last thing, and I, perhaps I should have led with it, but we do pay eight cents a word. I feel bad emphasizing, well, my, the sound on my computer, I can tell, is going wild. Um, <laughs> I could, I, I'm watching it just zoop down, you know, zip and flip over the place. Um, we pay eight cents a word, and I think it can be erroneous to call that a pro rate because nobody can. If you were to sell stories, you know, based on eight cents a word, we only accept up to six thousand words. Nobody's gonna make a living on that. But we are the only mm. dedicated sword and sorcery magazine that is offering that, and I think it it, it it's inescapable that that raises our operating cost. But we believe in it. We believe in the in giving authors a market where they get paid something closer to a fair wage for their work. And so if you want to support that, if you want authors and artists to be paid well for their work, to be paid close to what they deserve, perhaps not exactly what they deserve. I think we, I, I, my hope is that we will end up being able to pay more if our Kickstarters end up being more successful. But the first step to getting to that higher wage is to helping fund what we can pay for them now, which is eight cents a word, which is the SFWA, sort of, or at least it was, their qualifying sort of uh, bar for a pro market. So I've rambled on a lot about the Kickstarter now at this point. I apologize. but Don't apologize. You were directly it's... solicited to do so. <laughs> Sell your thing, man. <laughs> sure. But I think, so yes, if, if those qualities sound appealing to you, then please do support our Kickstarter. And if you feel as if you don't have the funds to do so, I understand completely, but I, I, I would love it if you could uh, share it with people, even if you have a very small platform, every little bit counts. Sharing it and letting people know and saying, hey, this is cool, you never know. So whatever step that you feel is appropriate, just know that we thank you for it and we appreciate all the support we've gotten so far. You know, we started out only about a year and a half ago. We were paying five cents a word. We were a little bit more successful than we thought we were, so we raised it to eight cents a word. And we're, we're happy with how the magazine's going, and, and we're, we're very lucky to have the fans that we have, and we're very lucky to be able to work with the authors that we're working with. Um, yeah, that's my spiel. Thank you for listening. All right, awesome, man. And we will make sure that the link to this Kickstarter, although you can just go to Kickstarter and search Old Moon Quarterly, that's nice and easy too, we'll put the link in the show notes for the podcast upload and the description underneath the video for the YouTube upload. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I really enjoyed discussing uh, Evil Honey by Steve Angie, found in issue three of OMQ, available on Amazon now. And again, go check out that Kickstarter. Um, yeah, so our story for December's chat will be the one that was originally going to be for this month until I was like, oh, wait, no, we, I want to do all the <laughs> quarterly. <laughs> so uh, next month, uh, December's story will be Dara's Tale from issue seven of Tales from the Magician's Skull. Uh, date TBD, uh, but we will announce it later. All right. Again, thank you, Jay, 
Graham and Matt for joining us. I look forward to us all celebrating a magnificent uh, victory for the Oldman Quarterly Kickstarter at the end of this month.